Structure of linguistics is an approach to linguistics originating from the work of Swiss linguists Ferdinand de Saussure, and is part of the overall approach of structuralism. De Saussure's course in general linguistics, published posthumously in 1916, stressed examining language as a static system of interconnected units. He is thus known as a father of modern linguistics for bringing about the shift from diachronic, historical, to synchronic, non-historical analysis, as well as for introducing several basic dimensions of semiotic analysis that are still important today, such as syntagmatic and paradigmatic analysis, or associations, as Salcher was still calling them. Structure of linguistics thus involved collecting a corpus of utterances, and in attempting to classify all of the elements of the corpus at their different linguistic levels, the phonemes, morphemes, lexical categories, noun phrases, verb phrases, and sentence types. One of Sauscher's key methods was syntagmatic and paradigmatic analysis, that respectively define units syntactically and lexically according to their contrast with the other units in the system. Structure of linguistics is now regarded by some professional linguists as outdated and as superseded by developments such as cognitive linguistics and generative grammar. Jan Koster states, Sauscher, considered the most important linguist of the century in Europe, until the 1950s, hardly plays a role in current theoretical thinking about language, while cognitive linguist Mark Derner reports that many of Sauscher's concepts were wrong on a grand scale and Norman and Holland notes that Sauscher's views are not held, so far, as I know, by modern linguists. Only by literary critics, Lacanians, and the occasional philosopher, others have made similar observations. History Structure of linguistics begins with the posthumous publication of Ferdinand de Saussure's course in general linguistics, in 1916, which was compiled from lectures by his students. The book proved to be highly influential, providing the foundation for both modern linguistics and semiotics. After Saussure, the history of structure of linguistics branches off in two directions. First, in America, linguist Leonard Bloomfield's reading of Sauscher's course proved influential, bringing about the Bloomfelden phase in American linguistics that lasted from the mid-1930s to the mid-1950s. Bloomfield bracketed all questions of semantics and meaning as largely unanswerable and encouraged a mechanistic approach to linguistics. The paradigm of Bloomfeld in linguistics in American linguistics was replaced by the paradigm of generative grammar with the publication of Noam Chomsky's Syntactic Structures in 1957. Second, in Europe, Sauscher influenced the Prague School of Roman Jacobson and Nikolai Trubetskoy, whose work would prove hugely influential, particularly concerning phonology, and the school of Louis Jelmslev. Structure of linguistics also had an influence on other disciplines in Europe, including anthropology, psychoanalysis, and Marxism, bringing about the movement known as structuralism. Linguists who published articles on structuralism include Leonard Bloomfield, Charles F. Hockett, John Lyons, R. H. Robbins, Otto Jesperson, Emil Benveniste, Edward Sapir, Andre Martinet, Thomas Givon, F. R. Palmer, Fair and Clifford, Robert D. Van Valen, Louis Jelmslev, and Ariel Shishahay Levy. Basic Theories and Methods The foundation of structure of linguistics is a sign, which in turn has two components, a signified is an idea or concept, while the signifier is a means of expressing the signified. The sign is thus the combined association of signifier and signified. Signs can be defined only by being placed in contrast with other signs, which forms the basis of what later became the paradigmatic dimension of semiotic organization, i.e., collections of terms slash entities, that stand in opposition. This idea contrasted drastically with the idea that signs can be examined in isolation from a language, and stressed Sauscher's point that linguistics must treat language synchronically. Paradigmatic relations hold among sets of units that, in the early Saussurean renditions, exist in the mind, such as the set distinguished phonologically by variation in their initial sound cat, bat, hat, mat, fat, or the morphologically distinguished setran, run, running.
The units of a set must have something in common with one another, but they must contrast too, otherwise they could not be distinguished from each other, and would collapse into a single unit, which could not constitute a set on its own, since a set always consists of more than one unit. Syntagmatic relations, in contrast, are concerned with how units, one selected from their paradigmatic sets of oppositions, are chained together into structural roles. These dimensions, still fundamental to all linguistic and semiotic organization, are often confused with other, related, but quite distinct dimensions of organization. Prominent examples of this are the confusion of paradigmatic with spatial relationships and syntagmatic with temporal relations. For the latter, for example, the fact that in spoken language syntagmatic units come, one after the other, is misread as a temporal relationship rather than the abstract structural relationship that it actually is. Thus, in written language, syntagmatic units are organized by spatial sequentiality and not by temporal sequentiality. These conflations can be quite pernicious and need to be watched for carefully when reading texts purporting to use sosore on or semiotic methods. One further common confusion here is that syntagmatic relations, assumed to occur in time, are anchored in speech and are considered either diachronic, confusing syntagmatic with historical, or are part of parole. Everyday speech confusing syntagmatic with performance and behavior and divorcing it from the linguistic system, or both. Both paradigmatic and syntagmatic organizations belong to the abstract system of language lang, French for language, or an abstract, platonic ideal. Different linguistic theories place different weight on the study of these dimensions, all structural and generative accounts. For example, pursue primarily characterizations of the syntagmatic dimension of the language system, syntax, while functional approaches such as systemic linguistics focus on the paradigmatic. Both dimensions need to be appropriately included, however. Syntagmatic and paradigmatic relations provide the structure a linguist with a tool for categorization for phonology, morphology, and syntax. Take morphology, for example. The signs cat and cats are associated in the mind, producing an abstract paradigm of the word forms of cat. Comparing this with other paradigms of word forms, we can note that in the English language the plural often consists of little more than adding an s to the end of the word. Likewise, through paradigmatic and syntagmatic analysis, we can discover the syntax of sentences. For instance, contrasting the syntagma je dois, I should and dois je, should I, allows us to realize that in French we only have to invert the units to turn a sentence into a question. We thus take syntagmatic evidence, difference in structural configurations, as indicators of paradigmatic relations, e.g., in the present case, questions versus assertions. The most detailed account of the relationship between a paradigmatic organization of language as a motivator and classifier for syntagmatic configurations is that set out in the systemic network organization of systemic functional grammar, where paradigmatic relations and syntagmatic configurations each have their own separate formalization, related by realization constraints. Modern linguistic formalisms that work in terms of lattices of linguistic signs, such as head-driven phrase structure grammar, similarly begin to separate out an explicit level of paradigmatic organization. So SOAR develops structure of linguistics, with its idealized vision of language, partly because he was aware that it was impossible in his time to fully understand how the human brain and mind created and related to language. So Saussure set out to model language in purely linguistic terms, free of psychology, sociology, or anthropology. That is, Saussure was trying precisely not to say what goes on in your or my mind when we understand a word or make up a sentence. Saussure was trying to de-psychologize linguistics. Recent Reception Linguist Noam Chomsky maintained that structure of linguistics was efficient for phonology and morphology because both have a finite number of units that the linguist can collect. However, he did not believe structure of linguistics was sufficient for syntax, reasoning that an infinite number of sentences could be uttered, rendering a complete collection impossible. Instead, 
he proposed the job of the linguist was to create a small set of rules that could generate all the sentences of a language and nothing but those sentences. Chomsky's critics led him to found generative grammar. One of Chomsky's key objections to structure of linguistics was its inadequacy in explaining complex and slash or ambiguous sentences. As Early writes, John is easy to please and John is eager to please look, as if they had exactly the same grammatical structure. Each is a sequence of noun copula adjective infinitive verb. But in spite of this surface similarity the grammar of the two is quite different. In the first sentence, though it is not apparent from the surface word order, John functions as the direct object of the verb to please. The sentence means, it is easy for someone to please John. Whereas in the second John functions, as the subject of the verb to please, the sentence means, John is eager that he please someone. That this is a difference in the syntax of the sentences comes out clearly in the fact that English allows us to form the noun phrase John's eagerness to please out of the second, but not John's easiness to please out of the first. There is no easy or natural way to account for these facts within structuralist assumptions. By the latter half of the 20th century, many of Salcher's ideas were under heavy criticism. In 1972, Chomsky described structure of linguistics as an impoverished and thoroughly inadequate conception of language, while in 1984, Marcus Mitchell declared that structure of linguistics was fundamentally inadequate to process the full range of natural language, and furthermore was held by no current researchers, to my knowledge. Holland writes that it was widely accepted that Chomsky had decisively refuted Salcher. Much of Chomsky's work is not accepted by other linguists, and I am not claiming that Chomsky is right, only that Chomsky has proven that Salcher is wrong. Linguists who reject Chomsky claim to be going beyond Chomsky, or they claim to phrase structure grammars. They are not turning back to Salcher. Holland's pessimistic view of Salcher's influence in contemporary linguistics is not universally agreed to. In 2012, Gilbert Lazard dismissed the Chomskyan approach as pass while applauding a return to Sosorea and structuralism as the only course by which linguistics can become more scientific. In the 1950s Salcher's ideas were appropriated by several prominent figures in continental philosophy, and from there were borrowed in literary theory, where they are used to interpret novels and other texts. However, several critics have charged that Salcher's ideas have been misunderstood or deliberately distorted by continental philosophers and literary theorists, and are certainly not directly applicable to the textual level which Salcher himself would have firmly placed within parole and so not amenable to his theoretical constructs. For example, Surly maintains that, in developing his deconstruction method, Jacques Derrida altered one of Salcher's key concepts. The correct claim that the elements of the language only function as elements because of the differences they have from one another is converted into the false claim that the elements are constituted under Derrida. The traces of these other elements 